Plate chillers and counterflow chillers are two tools to take boiling wort and quickly chill it ready for yeast pitch. But which works best? I've run these chillers through a series of tests and the results will, no joke, change the way I chill my wort forever. So to test this out, I've got two cooling devices. I've got this plate chiller from Claw Hammer Supply. This came with my Claw Hammer Supply system and I've used this for ooh, over 100 batches. And then new in the brewery, I have this Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller. Now I'm gonna compare these across three tests. But before we do that, should probably really explain what the difference is between a plate chiller and a counterflow chiller. So plate chillers consist of multiple cascading metal plates welded together. The chiller channels hot wort in one direction while cold water flows in the other direction, separated by those multiple plates. This results in extracting heat from the wort. Those plates are quite close together, which means unless you're careful, they can get clogged, especially for highly hopped beers. Now compare that to a counterflow chiller. It's basically the same idea. Hot wort flows in one direction and cold water flows in the other. But instead of using plates, a counterflow chiller uses concentric tubes. There's a smaller tube made out of copper where the wort flows and a larger tube where the water flows in the opposite direction. As the copper tubing is quite a bit wider than the gaps between plates and a plate chiller, a counterflow chillers are much less prone to clogging. So you can see here on my plate chiller, we've got these welded plates here. This is a pretty skinny plate chiller. You can see some with many more plates, but honestly, this has done the job pretty well for me. And both of these have been customized with quick disconnects. So I have disconnects here for the wort, which will connect into my kettle. And then I have disconnects here for the water, which will connect in to my hose. And I've done exactly the same on this guy here, the exchillerator. So we have wort, wort, water, water, and I also have a valve on here where I could actually stop the flow of wort if I need to. And I can measure the temperature of the wort that's coming out through this thermometer on the top here. So it's time for test number one. I'm not brewing any beer today, so I don't have any hot wort to send through this. So I'm just gonna boil some water and pass this through. So test number one is single pass, which is to say we're gonna take everything through the chiller directly and then dump it out and measure the temperature at that point. So just one pass through. Now I'm gonna start with the claw hammer plate chiller and let me just explain all of the hookups here because it looks kind of confusing. But basically I have my hot liquid here in my kettle, comes out here, goes into a pump, comes out of the pump and into the plate chiller. That's wort in, then wort out is going to go into this rather large Erlenmeyer flask. And then I'm gonna measure the temperature of the water, comparing the temperature difference from there into here. See how much temperature it can drop. Now, in order to drop the temperature, we need some cold water. So I've hooked that up. I have a hose here, water in, and you'll notice that water in is the opposite side to the wort in. So cold water comes in one side, the hot wort will come in the other side. And then out here, this is where the water dumps back out into the sink. Now the other factor to consider with this is what temperature water you're using. I'm just using water out of my tap. That water is around 70 Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius. So that's what I'm working with. All right, let's get water flowing through here. So now water is passing through the plate chiller. Feels nice and cold. And now I'm going to pump the wort, in this case hot water, which is 112 Fahrenheit, through here into here. I'm just gonna grab a couple of liters of this water. I have my trusty infrared thermometer, and that's reading 93 Fahrenheit. Now the counterflow chiller is also a confusing mix of tubing, but the basic idea here is the hot wort is coming in at the bottom, and it's coming back out at the top here where it's going to end up back in that flask and then the water the water works in reverse so the cold water comes in here flows through in the opposite direction and then comes out as wastewater here so basically you kind of have a hot side here hot wort and then the hot wastewater and then the cold side the cold water in and the cooler wort coming out so let's give this a go single pass through see what we get after two liters 
that is getting 91 Fahrenheit. Not a whole lot of difference, but uh, I've got a second test in mind. Now option two is to reduce the flow that's passing through this plate chiller because at least in theory, the slower that the hot liquid passes through here, the more contact time it will have with the colder water that's cooling it and it should be able to cool things quicker. So in order to test that, I have reduced the flow on my pump. So it's now really only half open, which should mean it's gonna flow a lot slower. And you can see here that this is flowing much slower now than before. And that's made a big difference. That is now 78. Still not quite pitching temperature, but considering that my groundwater is 70 and this is cooled to 78 through a single pass at reduced flow, pretty good. So half speed now through the counterflow chiller and I'm seeing temperature here of 75. That is almost pitching rate. You could almost throw some yeast in there. That makes quite a difference when you do throttle down the flow here and give the, the wort of hot liquid chance to really be in contact with the cold liquid going the other way. Now, this is all very well, but these two experiments don't replicate what I do on brew day. So to test that out, we need to do test number three. Now, while I'm focusing on process here, which is faster, which is easier to use, that sort of thing, there is the question of, does your choice of chiller make any difference to the finished beer? A quickly cooling wood results in the coagulation of proteins and other solids into large chunks called cold break that readily drop out of solution. And in general, the quicker the cold break happens, the better. Slower cooling can result in a bunch of problems like the formation of DMS or isomerization of alpha acids, which is beyond what you were planning or the increased risk of contamination. And a brewlosophy experiment put that to the test. So two batches of German pills were brewed. In one batch, the wort was chilled with a plate chiller and the second identically brewed beer was chilled with, well, with an immersion chiller. Yep, counterflow chiller would have been way better for my purposes. But, but anyway, we have two different cooling methods going head to head in a triangle test with tasting panels and whatnot. So were participants able to distinguish between wort cooled using a plate chiller and wort cooled with an immersion chiller? Well, each participant was served two samples of the immersion chiller beer and one sample of the plate chiller beer. Of the 24 participants, 13 tasters would have to select the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance. Did they? No. Nine made the correct selection, indicating participants were unable to reliably distinguish a pilsner where the wort was chilled with an immersion chiller from one where the wort was chilled with a plate chiller. Now, would counterflow chiller versus plate chiller have changed the results? Maybe. Personally, I'd be surprised if it had any discernible impact, but you know what will have a discernible impact? The time I spend chilling my wort. Let's find out which way is faster once and for all. Test three represents what I do on my brew day, which is the recirculation method. So the hot wort still comes through the chiller, but instead of going into the fermentation vessel at that point, I'm gonna dump it back in to the boil kettle. So you can see here that this line now is running back into the kettle. So I'm gonna start this time with the counterflow chiller. I've got five gallons of boiling wort here, boiling wort -er, actually, and I'm gonna run this for five minutes recirculating. When the five minutes is up, I will then move it into here, take another measurement, and we'll see if the temperature drop. I can actually keep an eye on the temperature here. This is the temperature reported in the kettle, and you can see it dropping. Five minutes is up. See if the temperature's dropped in the kettle now to about 130 something. So now let's send this into the flask. And that is showing 74 Fahrenheit. That's for five minutes of circulation, five minutes of running water through this thing, and then moving it into here. Let's try the plate chiller. So the wort out here is going straight back into the kettle. Recirculate for five minutes. Let's do it. Mm. Five minutes is up. That seems to have chilled the stuff in the kettle faster. Let's see if that pans out. 
Well, interesting. That's given me a reading of 80 Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's the three tests. How about some conclusions? So when it comes to which chills faster, there's no clear winner. They both do a great job. So maybe your choice comes down to something other than cooling time. The plate chiller is a much smaller footprint. The counterflow chiller uses wider tubing and that can ensure that you're not going to get blockages, particularly when you're doing whirlpools, for example, and you have a lot of hops in the wort. The plate chiller could potentially get blocked. That said, it's never been an issue. There was, however, a big difference in method, a clear winner, method two. So reducing the flow going through just makes such a big difference and has a very minimal amount of water usage. Method three, which I've been using because I thought I needed to, is extremely wasteful of water and is not something I'm going to be doing again. And by the way, there is one other variable that I didn't look at, which could significantly reduce the cooling time, and that is the water temperature, the cooling water temperature. I'm using my tap water, it was 70 Fahrenheit. I could have instead prepared a bucket of ice water, and particularly if I use method two, which doesn't require a whole bunch of water, it would be quite feasible, I think, to fill a bucket with ice water and then pump that through these chillers, and I think you'd get a much reduced time. Okay, so that's it. I've learned something today. I'm gonna change how I chill. I hope maybe you have too. And if you have your own chilling methods and techniques and you'd like to share them, please put them in the comments. I'd love to hear how you're doing this.